Hey, what's up, dudes and dudettes? Drew, ThatAnxietyGuy.com, back again with my friend Monique Colvin, all the way from Canada with her wisdom and kindness and smileys. Oh, thank you. Happy, welcome. To Happy to be here again. This is our second take. Again, technical difficulties. Ruin everything. So today, we have a good topic today. This is right up Monique's alley. Um, we're going to talk about thoughts and how maybe not to be dragged around by them. Like the fact that you do not have to follow every single thought that comes in your head. Mm. So since this is kind of your topic, and I think you have more to add to it than I do, let's, um, I'm going to let you start. Tell me about what the issue is with thinking. Why is it a problem sometimes? Uh, essentially, I mean, this was revolutionary. I mean, I thought I understood about thinking. Mm -hmm. I know nothing. <laughs> because as I started to really understand our design, the way we're created, the way we work psychologically, I started to see that as human beings, we feel our thinking physically, you know, somatically. Mm -hmm. And so when we have a thought, whether it's true or not, whether it's, you know, um, something happy, something sad, a traumatic thought, um, whatever it is, we're going to experience it. We're going to experience it somatically. We're going to feel our thinking. Sure. Huge for me when I started to recognize that we're living in the feeling of our thinking moment to moment. And therefore, a lot of our thinking feels real because we have the physical sensations. We're responding. Mm -hmm. Our body's responding to our thoughts. We get the physical sensations of it. So even if it's a, a thought that's not true, because we feel it, we make stories about it and we conclude that it's real. And that is a really big problem for us in that it's like it's hidden. Because we have eyes, we see what's going on, but we don't really see what's invisible, which is our thinking. And so I think that it's the fact that I didn't get all the things off my to-do list that's making me anxious or it's because I've been on the couch too long that's making me anxious and I didn't get enough stuff done or you know or whatever it is and I would blame out there and I didn't understand that really there's this there's this whole invisible experience that we don't see that's creating a lot of our feelings and it becomes our experience of life Sure, that makes perfect sense, actually. It really does. And so we, we're kind of conditioned to a certain extent to, to honor our thoughts and our feelings. And yeah. you hear this so much, you know, especially in sort of the self-help, mental health space, especially, I'll just say it, these days when everybody that can breathe can become an expert and put up a channel and start talking about this stuff. We, <laughs> yeah. we hear that stuff all the time. Uh, check in with yourself, honor yourself. On, and and I'm, I'm with you. We, you. we have to love ourselves and, and all those things. But it's almost counterintuitive. Like you do not have to honor every single thought you have. Like it's not required. Um, in fact, you know, we were talking about it in our first take on this. If you look at some of the great philosophies and a lot of the stuff that you hear online is based in, in Taoism, Buddhism and those sort of things. And all the memes and the, the lakes with the calm lakes and all that stuff um, is based in those those things that say your thoughts are not you or it's really your thoughts and your reaction to the world that matters. It's not the actual world. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it's so hard for people to grasp that sometimes that it's not the fact that you, your wrist hurts. It's the fact that you feel that and then think I must have a life threatening blood clot. Exactly. And, and, and it's really like, I call it, it's like this huge illusion mm. that, that we're under because we don't see we just we're physical people we see what's in front of us mm -hmm. and we don't see you know what's what's underneath and yeah. that for me has been revolutionary because i never knew i was feeling my moment that was that was mind-blowing when yeah. i started right into that i thought i was feeling the world and when you're feeling the world oh my god you feel like a helpless victim because we all know we can't control you know what's going to come next what's going to happen correct it's nice to know that there's one place to look and that's that's within us in our mind what's happening inside us yeah and i think that's why people who get themselves into agoraphobic situations or they start to severely limit their lifestyle to only be in their safe or comfortable places or situations they there's that lack of understanding that says but it, you don't understand the problem you're bringing the problem with you everywhere so the problem exists on your sofa, in your bedroom, in your living room, at your favorite farm, or wherever you think is 
is safe, those thoughts are still with you. So, yeah, it almost doesn't matter. The place, the situation doesn't matter. It never matters. Yeah. yeah. I heard something somewhere, podcast or something, they were talking about, I don't know, millionaires who win lotteries, and it shows that like five years later, they're in the same place. Uh, yes. And why is that? Well, that's because the thinking is still going on. That hasn't changed. I'm going to introduce to you, I'm not going to take the credit for it. I'm going to give the credit to where it deserves, which I saw this and learned this from Dr. Amy Johnson, but it's something that's been extremely helpful when I work with my clients. Yeah. And we have this chatty, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is our chatty narrative self. That's the part that is talking and that is saying, you know, be careful, you better do this, you better do that, hurry up, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's going on nonstop. And a lot of that is conditioned. It's, mm -hmm. I call it, it's a computer brain, chatting, chatting. Right. But we take that as true, as real. What has really helped me was to start to see that that is just my conditioned experiences and, and, and that, you know, I don't have to listen and take what it's saying so seriously. I mm -hmm. don't. Because actually, think about it. If you... If you would be the way that this voice is with mm -hmm. you, to your friends, right? You have friends, right? They would ignore. They would ignore me and run away. Yeah, you would maybe, have friends. Maybe they do that. <laughs> and yet, you know, this is going on all the time, and a lot of times we're like, yeah, 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 we're agreeing yeah. with. You, you know? Yeah. And what I've done is I know it's there, blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But I started to see that I don't have to take my thoughts so seriously. Right. I don't, and that's been really helpful, knowing that. There's that, and then there's me. Yeah. And I, I think it's so foreign to people when I say things like, you are not required to respond to every thought you have. And so many people find that to be like a crazy thing to say. Like, what do you mean I don't have to? But it's my thought. I thought it. Like, I feel it. How do I not reason? Why? How can I? How, what are you telling me? But in a way, just like you said, if I was doing that to you, you'd probably hang up the call. You wouldn't want to listen to that. Right. And, and why is it so easy for us to look at other people? who are just expressing what's in their own heads and say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. She's a liar. She's fake. He's, he's making stuff up. Fake news. Everyone else can make up fake things that aren't true, but our, everything our brains make up is dead on true all the time. That's like, in a way, when you look at it that way, like, you know, your brain produces a hell of a lot of fake news. Yeah, totally. And, and again, you know, if you think about it, a lot of it is because it's been conditioned over and over and over again, you know, and we just, we don't really question it. It's just there. And we think it's us because it's talking in our voice. Mm -hmm. And I started to just sense that, oh no, that's not me. I would never want to talk to myself that way. And just kind of seeing that, just kind of uh, about it is really helpful. So I think, and it's good. It's sometimes just, you're right, being aware of it. And I find that people, when they finally grasp the concept of, oh, wait a minute, it is my thoughts that are fueling this. It's not so, and then they get, for at least my, my audience winds up in that cycle where there might be a sensation and then it, the thoughts lead to more sensations, which lead to more thoughts, and it feeds, right? So that, that's kind of horrible. And when they start to understand that like, oh, I can, I can have a thought, like you don't try and stop them. You can't ever stop them. And there's a ton, ton of research that thought suppression does not work. Um, in fact, somebody who just was a Kim Quinlan, I remember was posting a lot about that on Instagram the other day. But anyway, um, you're going to have the thoughts. It's okay to have the thought. The problem is what happens after that thought comes initially. So that thought that says, oh, I didn't get anything done today. I'm screwed. Like, for instance, or the thought that says, what was that? Was, was that a skipped heartbeat? Am I dying? Either way, they're the same thought, right? Right. So you have it. What comes next? What's the difference? You know, what's the difference between letting that thought run away with you and not? So what did you change? Well, you know, that's really interesting because as soon as I started to get onto this as I was recovering, mm -hmm. related to, to anxiety thoughts, yeah. Yeah. PTSD flashbacks and symptoms. Yeah. As I started to realize, okay, we'll use anxiety as an example. I would start to see myself, you know, this guy, oh, you know, that's going to happen or this or that. Don't do that. And I was on to it. I was on to it. And what I did was instead of really engaging with it, I knew that if I would engage with it and go with it, I knew exactly what would happen. Right. I'd feel more anxious. And I also knew that if I would start to, to want to do something with it, because like you said, we don't change our thoughts. I agree right. with you. 
I don't go there. But if yeah. a lot of people do, a lot of people think they have to do something. Oh, I'm having an anxious thought. Okay, well, I'm happy now, or I'm going to make it positive, or right. That, that's not helpful either. That no. just keeps it keeps it going. Yes. Yeah. So. I, some of the most heat that I've ever gotten was I did a video last year, something called "Positive Self Talk Is Bullshit." <laughs> And I got, yeah, I got a, a little bit of heat on that because people are like, what do you mean? I don't know. This is self-affirmations. I have to tell myself I'm okay. I have to talk myself down. I have to calm myself down. No, you don't. Like, you don't have to calm yourself down. Like, and you will calm down if you decide just to say, oh, I just had a thought that maybe I'm having a stroke. And really all that's happening right now is I'm thinking. So the only accurate description of what's happening right now is, oh, I'm thinking. Done. Story is over. You don't have to engage and try and do what you said. I'm going to change it. I'm going to make it positive. I'm going to visualize right. it. Because you perfect. never win. The ending, it's just, it yeah. just keeps fire going. Keeps it does. Going. Yeah. Because the I, chatter tooth guy always wins. Yeah. He never he never runs out of energy. Da, 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 right? So, so you asked me, and so that is what happened with me. And as I started to understand that I know what's going to happen if I go with that, and I don't want to feel that. Right started doing it less and less and you know it we've been doing this forever so it's not going to change instantly but it does start with awareness yeah. Watch, see that it's happening and you know see that if you not engage with it yeah and i think some of it i'll you know to put it back more into your arena i mean i can relate it to people who will experience what they will continually argue are impossible to ignore thoughts because this thought is so scary that you, you can your what you're telling me doesn't apply because this thought is really scary. Oh, your thoughts are scary, but this one's really scary. And I think you might, you know, the same might apply to, you know, kind of those flashbacks to these experiences that people have had in their past. Like how I, I can't possibly, but but what what I get is, oh yeah, that makes all kinds of sense. But what happens when I think this? What am I supposed to do with that? And the answer is always the same, right? You you keep doing the same thing. Uh, so I, I don't know if that makes sense. So do you treat, uh, for instance, in that PTSD or trauma background, the the stress or anxiety over not finishing to-do list and the stress or anxiety over thinking about something terrible that happened to you, literally happened to you 15 years ago, same thing, no? Like, in a, in a way, you're going you're gonna to re not react to that the same way. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. even... Yeah, right. So it doesn't matter what, what you're thinking, what you could be thinking the very worst thing or have the worst memory. It's still the same scenario. Yeah. When you start to have insight of what's really going on, because mm -hmm. um, I mean, before I knew all this, I used to tell myself, oh, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. And it meant right. nothing. Out yeah. the window. Yeah. I didn't, apply it. I didn't feel safe. But when I started to understand that, oh, you know, this is completely normal. I am having a thought. Right. And or a memory, it's coming to life, therefore I'm going to feel it, but it's designed to move through me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get in there and say, okay, so I gotta figure out what am I gonna do with this? What I, I have to twist it and make it I just it's just it will feel it and it wants to move through. And it yeah. always does. I mean, we've had so many thoughts during the day that we don't even remember. Why? Because they move through. Correct. But when it's a it's a, a thought that's a little bit more challenging, whether it's an anxious thought that we're scared of, oh, I got to drive here, or mm. that's going to happen, or, you know, a symptom and we want to do something with it. We, you know, suddenly we keep it stuck and we yeah. blow through because yeah. we have to do something with it. One of the greatest things I ever heard um, was the first introduction that I ever had to you. We, we sort of somehow connected online. I don't remember how that happened. Oh. And you sent me a video and said, watch this interview that I did with, I can't remember the woman's name. It was a, a video interview I dumped this person. And you, I was, I was out for a walk with, up with my dog and I was listening in my headphones and you said, I just spent years and years and years thinking about, well, I'd have this thought and then I would have to think, well, I have to get to my therapist and process it. I must, I have to process this. Like many years of like, I got to do something. I got to process this now until you discover like, no, I don't like, you know, and this is not to say that the past or your thoughts simply don't matter. They do, but they don't require all your attention and all your energy. All now, the time. I just want to say, and I have to be careful because um, yeah. it's really important to me, and that is that people who have had trauma, significant trauma, complex yes. childhood, repeated trauma, yes, there is, you know, I don't just go into, oh, it's your thoughts. And of course, oh, no. you know, we start with being a compassionate witness. Mm -hmm. What happened was really horrible. Yeah. But, 
and you don't have to become a prisoner to you know it coming all the time that's what happened they would come and they would come and then I would engage engage with them and run to this therapist or run to that but when I started to understand really the mechanism mm. of what's going on I just felt a lot safer yeah I would agree with you 100 percent I I, I I I'm with you on that you're right you, you can't just say oh it's just your thoughts forget it move on that's not that's not okay no yeah, but I think people tend maybe to get stuck, and again, maybe out of my lane a little bit here, but I, people seem to sometimes get stuck thinking that trauma or those past events is them. Like, that is them. Like, I must, yeah. there's some requirement to carry it, cloak myself in it, engage with it, process it, suffer it. Somehow that's required. So yeah. there's a happy medium between processing it and understanding and gaining perspective or peace or closure. And, and cloaking yourself in it, I'm going to say. Yeah, and also something you said, I was thinking about it actually, and that is that, you know, you could use the example of our thoughts, you know, people saying, oh, you are not your thoughts. So I mm -hmm. thought about, um, you know, people, for example, would say, I have PT PTSD or I have anxiety. And how they would say that is because this is their experience of life. I yeah. said, PTSD and when someone said hi how are you in my head I wanted to say fine PTSD how are you you know kind of thing because that's what it felt like right okay yeah but 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 here's the thing that really showed me that PTSD is not me how do I know it's not me and my identity because now that I'm on the other side and I don't have the symptoms so who am I now right right symptoms are there who am I now Therefore, I was never PTSD. And even people who are experiencing symptoms of PTSD or anxiety, yeah. that is not who you are. Yeah. Symptoms, thoughts, behaviors, beliefs that are showing up, it's your psychology, mm -hmm. but it's up here. It's not you, and it can move through. Experiences move through us, mm -hmm. but they're not us. It's, it's yeah. a very important thing to know. I think you're right. And so finding that balance between having to deal with maybe this past trauma or deal with whatever thoughts are producing your anxiety, it's, you have to do it at some point, but you, you don't have to be dragged around while it happens, I think. And it doesn't have to become a lifelong thing. You know, and it, and it brings up, it's a little beyond the topic that we're talking about now. We can do another one about this, I think. But like you said, well, now you're on the other side. So you're beyond it now. It's still a part of you and part of your past that you probably honor and in some ways respect because it makes you the Monique I know today to a certain extent. But I think I know people with the anxiety disorder problems as they begin to recover and get out of it, they find themselves in this foreign place. Like um, now what what am I? Now what do I do? Now what do I want to do? I mean, I'm not dealing with this all the time. Now life becomes a blank slate and that could sometimes be disturbing to people, right? Or intimidating. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because what you're doing is you're uncovering who you really are. Yeah. And in a way, it's fantastic because you get to decide, you know, what do I like? What right. am I interested in? Yeah. You know, what do I want to do? It's very exciting. It is very exciting. And it, it's, it's an, yeah, it's also to some people, I think, stressful, possibly even anxiety producing. It's, it's a little bit terrifying. Like, what do I do now? Now that I don't have to recover anymore, now what do I do? Yeah, yeah. I've so. Heard, I've heard people say um, that I work with that it's mm. gotten a lot, of quiet, a lot quieter in here. And mm. it's very scary because they're used to so much noise and suddenly it's quieter. And that, like you said, it can be kind of like uncomfortable. Like, yeah. You know? And I said, it's peace. Yeah. Imagine that. I know. It's amazing, right? So I think, you know, to bring it back and that thing that says, okay, you can learn. And, and, and I say this all the time, like, just because you have, you can learn how not to be dragged around by your thoughts. These are skills that you can learn, be taught and practice. So it has nothing to do with just brute forcing them, stuffing them, blocking them out, wrestling them into positive things. These are actual skills. I mean, so I talk about meditation and focus skills and mindfulness skills. I'm, I'm guessing you may use the same sort of tools. I don't know. I don't. You no. don't. Okay. No. Yeah. We're a little different in that way. Mm. I don't have any tools. They, they okay. a big revelation because what I find is that as I am sharing with my clients, they start to naturally fall into this kind of, not a state of meditation, but just a lot more space. Mm -hmm. and they, they get introduced to peace more yeah. easily, you know, because when this quiets down, what's left? 
That's so interesting. I would like to think that I'm, I'm reasonably sure that my people probably have the same experience, but what I, I get asked continuously, okay, I understand everything you're saying, but how do I do that? How do I not follow my thoughts? I know, the how to. The how do I do that? And to me, you know, saying, well, look, you can learn focus techniques. You can learn meditation techniques, breathing, relaxation. These are not shields or cures, but they can at least help you change the way you let your brain operate to a certain extent. Um, but I do, I do think that just accepting this to be true is, is maybe 40 to 50% of the battle. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so good. What else do we want to talk about? I wanted to show you my, now we, sh I should, we shared this like in one of our, <clears throat> one of our first uh, taping. I want to yes. use the snow globe again. <clears throat> yes. Maybe for those who have never seen it. Okay. Um, remember when I first saw it, it just, it, it was a good illustration of how it works with, with our thoughts. So I like to call it a thought storm. So a, sto a thought storm is when we've got so much on our mind, you know, like, 15 things on our mind floating around. And of course, when that's happening, we're mm. feeling it. And oftentimes we think we need to do something with it. So we'll get in there and say, okay, well, I'll grab my list and I'll, you know, whatever it is. We're trying to manage all those things that are in the thought storm. Right. And what happens naturally without us even getting involved is that when we don't get involved, mm -hmm. we try to get in there, which I feel keeps it going, keeps it mm -hmm. going it naturally wants to move through or calm down or settle down. It always does. Right. So is an example. So this is a snow globe. It's my daughter's. It says, yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay. So this is going to be an example of a thought storm. So I'm going to shake it up. Right. Really shake it up. And you see, these are our thoughts, a thought storm. Mm. Look what happens when you leave it alone. Can you see that? Yeah, sure. I can see it. Yeah. So they naturally settle down. And that's what happens when we don't get in there. When we yeah. just sit it and know that naturally we'll just settle down. That's true. And the shaking is the is the engaging. Right? So yeah. when you're engaging and arguing and you know, I gotta think about this, I have to carry this with me. I have to you know. I, I've heard people say things like, you know, schedule time to do it. That's a technique I've heard people say, you know what, give you Ted, from 6 p.m. to 6.20 p.m. tonight, this is when I will sit and, and worry about my stuff. I don't know what I think about that. I, try I don't know either. Things. Yeah, I don't know either. Did I ever tell you that story? No. Oh, my gosh. In my search for help, there was this something on, um, I think it was Facebook or whatever, yeah. and it said that if you do this particular activity, which was a, I think it was a personal inventory, yeah. You will be healed of your anxiety and your, it worked. Yeah, yeah. So I'm in for it. Yep. It was every single day you had to wake up in the morning and first thing on your mind, you write down every single fear you have. Well, I did that. Every single fear. Did it day one, did it day two. By day three, I was so bloody anxious. Yeah. I wrote this person and I said, I'm feeling so anxious. He said, stop doing it. <laughs> so that was a really good lesson and that what I, how I see it now is that I was basically writing out all my fears, putting mm -hmm. them on paper. Then they were within me floating through my mind. They were coming to life. Yeah. I, not necessary. Well, you what that act, because it's so funny, write down your fears, whether you're writing them, typing them, whatever. When we want to learn new things, we're studying for an exam. We, people will always say, write it down, write note cards. Because it is literally the best way we have to build those neural <laughs> pathways. So you are literally studying your fear by doing that. Like it's the best learning we have. That's crazy in a way when you think about that. Yeah, I was building new pathways. Thank you very much. <laughs> Along those lines, it's so interesting. I, I was unaware that I've been like a practicing stoic for years without even being blissfully unaware of the philosophy. But one of the things that, that Stoicism teaches you is a practice called, it's, it's in Latin, like premeditatio malorum. And it's, it's the premeditation of, of fears or the worst case. So like Marcus Aurelius and those people would sit down every day in some way and think, today I'm going to encounter people that piss me off. Or in the, in the modern world, today I will encounter mean people or ignorant people. Or today, you know, I may have money problems or, or there will be traffic. I will have to wait online at the bank. You basically prepare yourself for the things that you that are going to happen today. 
that you know you can't control. And there's a beauty in it, but there's also the danger of that. So I've had people say like that thing where I'm supposed to confront my fears in my head, for some people it works out well, for some people not so much. Um, yeah, and, and you're a living proof of like, yeah, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> maybe don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find now that I understand that our thinking comes to life. Yes. I'm going to be thinking about my greatest fears. Well, I'm going to be feeling my greatest fears. No, thanks. Yeah. What, why? Right. Exactly. Especially if they've proven to be irrational and baseless mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Yeah, I get that. So I think probably that practice I mean, it's supposed to let you understand that they're irrational and baseless, but mm, I don't know. Anyway, um, all right, I, we've gone for like 25 minutes here. That's that's a bit of a while. So anything else to add or? Well, the only thing I can say is I just want to repeat that we are always living in the feeling of our thinking moment to moment and that you are you really are safe, that what you're experiencing you're, you know, is normal and with understanding and gentleness and self-compassion. Yeah. Okay. You are okay. Yeah. I will, I guess, cap it off by saying in the most simplest terms, this is my way. You do not have to honor every freaking thought you have every moment of the day. It is perfectly okay to think something terribly scary and disturbing and then turn away from it mm -hmm. and think something else or nothing mm -hmm. like those are all acceptable things. And I think the sooner we accept that to be more of a natural reality for a healthy human being, probably the better off it's going to be. We and do not have Because when you, it's very good what you're saying, because when you turn away from it, mm -hmm. another thought pops in your mind, you're going to have a completely different experience. Exactly. That's exactly right. And maybe that thought is one you want to turn away from too. There's also nothing wrong with repeating that process. Mm -hmm. People, yeah, but they keep coming. Okay. So do that 10,000 times in the next hour. If you must, you will learn the skill and it will become easier and easier and easier and easier. So that's, I think all I can add, like, this is so doable. It's so doable, even though it sounds crazy to a lot of people. So anyway, all right, awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time as always. More time than people even know because of our little technical snafus. And uh, let's let's mention this. So maybe when we hang up, we're talking about Instagram for a second. People yeah. should, yeah. So Monique is, you have a great Instagram account. I love your Instagram account. So te where do people find you? I will link it anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, it's um. So it's called cptsd.recover.coach. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and it's a great, great, great feed and there's all kinds of gems in there. So. We, I, you know, my Instagram account is that underscore anxiety underscore guy. I had to put the underscores in. Go figure. So we are talking about doing some Instagram live video too, right? So if you guys are watching, I will link us both there and all of your, I'll put all your links in uh, your Instagram, your website, your Facebook, all that stuff. And uh, that is the podcast. You have a great <laughs> podcast. Yes. Um, but if you start at Monique Coven coaching, correct? That's has pretty much has everything in it. That's where you are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very cool. But uh, yeah, so maybe we'll do a little Instagram as soon as we hang up here. We'll try that little experiment. So look for us there. Fun. Yeah, very good. All right. I guess we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Monique. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See ya. Less awkward moment, but still awkward. Ready? Here we go. <laughs>